Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the next video in our Renle Chateau, well, not Renle Chateau, our Southern Mysteries of Southern France series. And we're moving beyond Renle Chateau now. Now we're going to start moving into the countryside and start looking at the other locations and other churches and other priests and other information. I shot this video yesterday and it wound up being almost an hour and I thought that was just too long for the information I wanted to provide. So I'm going to try to keep this one to around 30 minutes, tighten up the presentation, uh, say a little bit less, but let you go dig into more if you want to go get that information yourself. Today we're going to look at uh, landscape geometry. We're going to be looking at the village of René Labain and its priest, Henry Boudet. We'll be looking at his book, We'll be looking at paintings in René Labain. We'll be looking at their connection to Notre Dame de Marcial in Lemieux. We'll be looking as well at, uh, if there's time, the uh, death of Antoine Gilles. So to get us moving, let's look at landscape geometry. And this is, this is a really important part of the story as we begin moving into deeper detail. Henry Lincoln is the one who has claimed to have found these land, these, this, this, um, these, these geometric shapes like this one on the landscape. Now, what's interesting about Lincoln, and this is really important to get the story, you have to remember, he was the one who was claimed to have started researching the story after reading uh, de Sade's, Gary de Sade's book in 1969. Makes three BBC documentaries right before he writes his, uh, his famous 1982 book, Holy Blood, Holy Grail. But right in between this period, right between when he's making the last of his um, BBC documentaries, and I should watch it to see how much he's talking about landscape geometry in there, but he's just starting to move into the landscape geometry, starting to move into what, what's going on in the landscape. And just at that moment is when he bumps into um, his fellow authors, Michael Bagant and Jason Lee. Why is this interesting? Because after meeting Bagant and Lee, Lincoln turns completely away from the landscape geometry theory, which he doesn't bring out until another almost 15 years later in this book, The Holy Place, and instead focuses on the Jesus bloodline theory. Now, why is this important? Well, when we look at Michael Baganet, uh, he, he is the Grand Officer of the United Grand Masonic Lodge in England. He's editor of Freemasonry Free, Free Today and is the trustee of the Canterbury Masonic Research Center. So why is this high-ranking Freemason so interested to write a story of a Jesus bloodline in France with Henry Lincoln? And right at the moment, Lincoln is getting into the landscape geometry, which I think is one of the most absolutely important parts of the story. It's almost like there was a, a misdirection played somehow, and that Lincoln's information in this area needed to be, needed to be turned away. Because now when anyone thinks of the Renle Chateau story, they think, oh, the Jesus had a kid story. They don't think of the other things that we're going to be going through, for example, today. Um, now, I don't want to say that necessarily Lincoln was played. I mean, he's, again, he, he's got a strange history himself, right? You know, with the name change, the what year did he really come into the story? How, how was he really connected with the sad and the people who, who uh, were making this thing? Um, he's, he's, he was... Uh, claimed to be a faith healer, right? His son claims he's a, he was a famous healer before he started writing these books. And in 2003, he was given honorary knighthood into the Temple of Scotia at New, ba New Battle Abbey in Scotland in recognition of his work in the areas of sacred geometry and Templar history. So we have to throw all this on the table, but what is clear is what I'm showing you on the screen. This, the geometry of the landscape is very clear. That is 100% fact. Why is it important? In Lincoln's claims, uh, he, he presents that this came to him from after finding a, part, a, a pentacle in the parchment, after finding a pentacle in the Poussin painting, the, advi the art advisor suggested, why don't you go see if you can find a pentacle on the landscape? And on supposedly laying, laying down the uh, map of the area on the table, he instantly saw that from Renle, places like from Renle Chateau to... Um, uh, to Bijou, to Blanchefort, and to two other key mountains. So he, he made this perfect, exact pentagram on the landscape. 
the coincidence in this is would be like in the billions of you know billions to one to be able to have these key mountains with these key locations bijou is the uh, bijou was the home was the 12th century home of the grand master of the knights templar well castle uh, castle blanchefort of course is uh, a key one of the of the family connected with the tombstones so we have this incredible geometry of the landscape and through his own work, which you can read in the book Holy Place, I don't want to go into detail with it, and through the book, uh, through the work of a book uh, by a guy named David Wood, who read Lincoln and then started digging into it further himself, he wrote, I think it's called Gen Isis. He tried to sh trying to show that southern France is somehow linked with the with ancient Egyptian um, ancient Egyptian deities or ancient Egy ancient Egyptian. I, I don't fully agree with all of his theories, but I don't disagree with the foundation argument that there's a much bigger connection here. But as you can see in some of the photo and some of the images I'm just going to show you now, so many things in the landscape are in perfect geometric harmony from the distance, all the distance of, of churches have the same, have the same distance between them. Uh, certain landscapes have, have perfect, uh, perfectly laid out geometry. If you're right in the middle where things intersect is a cave. Um, uh, one example is, um, there's a there's a a number of churches in the area are are located on a perfect circle with a radius of two miles, two miles one thousand six hundred and eighteen yards, and of course one point six one eight is phi the golden section right the governing geometric principle for the growth of everything in the universe. So here all of this is laid out in a sense of a of of the golden section. Now this was not done by. The Catholic priests or the people who are putting up the churches themselves, right? Churches were particularly the early earliest Catholic churches were always placed on top of ancient sites. So when they come to a new area, they would just tear down the monument, tear down the stone circle, tear down the temple that was there, and build their church right on top of it, because they knew they knew that the ancients knew where the power spot was. That's where the energy was, and so they they were basically taking over the not just taking over the land, they were taking over the energy, and they were following. They weren't the ones laying down the grid work. The grid work was already there. They were just they were just reappropriating the grid work. I do this here in Scandinavia all the time. If I'm looking for stone circles, I'll just go find an old church, and usually there'll always be one stone still there from something that had been at that site. They tore down all of it but kept one stone. There'll be one giant stone, and then I'll just start fanning out sort of in a circular pattern around that church, and it won't take me long to find other sites that are still in the woods, still that nobody knows about, but that's, that's your focal point. They're building on the ancient site, and that's what happened here. So when you're seeing this geometry of the landscape, and it's, it's non-coincidental, it's, it's, this landscape was somehow seen by the ancients to be unbelievably sacred because of the way, because of the way everything had been, had been sort of created and positioned um, from, from, its, from its origin. And so they were enhancing an already sacred landscape by building their temples and sites <clears throat> within the geometry of the landscape. So I don't want to go into too much detail on that. I went into a lot of detail in the last video, and so I'm, I'm going to just allow you to go into this yourself. David Wood, uh, Henry Lincoln's book, The Holy Place, I highly recommend. It's a really important part of the mystery. You need to understand the geometry of the landscape to start seeing that the entire site is like a gigantic mathematical energetic grid and exactly who set up the grid who understood the grid what they were using the grid for we're hoping that's one of the things that by the time i get through all of these videos we're going to start knowing a bit more about so let's take us to the site of rennie le which means the place of the water it was it's a it's a place of healing waters uh, just sort of across the valley from Rennes le Chateau. Um, its priest, Henry Boudet, is the one we're going to look at now. But before we look at him, I want to bring in, because uh, René Lebain links to another key church, and that's Notre Dame de Marcial, which we'll look at in the next video. It requires time just for, for, just for it. It's, it's that important. But their priest... Some consider him to be the, the originator of what might be called this modern mystery. That's Henry Gask. Henry Gask was the priest of Notre Dame de Martial from around 1820 to like 1872, somewhere in those 
those uh, years. And the story claims is that he's the one who found a key tomb, and he's the one who understood what the deep mystery of this place was. He's the one who first rebuilt his church in extremely alchemic and Templar fashion in the middle 1800s. And just after he died, and he was the teacher of Henry Boudet, who we'll see here at René Labay. And when Gask died in 1882, that's when Boudet, four years later, writes his book, which is supposed to put the information of the landscape into book form. And then it seems the suggestion goes is that Boudet then got Saunier to take what was in the book in, in, and re-put it in physical symbol in the church of Rennes le Chateau. So all of these things are linked. And you'll see that Henry Gask and Henry Boudet are going to be very linked to our story. So Henry, so we'll start with René Labain and their, and their priests. The first priest we have to look at is Jean V. Jean V is the one who was um, the priest of René Labain right around the same time as Gask, and he, he dies in August 30th, 1872, right at the time Gask is forced out of um, Notre Dame de Marcial. The, uh, pr the bishop of Carcassonne at the time didn't like him for some reason and, and uh, got rid of Gask, put in Lazarists, uh, who also <laughs> enter the story, this group of um, St. Paul de Vincent Lazarists, puts them in charge for 10 years until a new bishop takes over, the very bishop who becomes very close to Saunier and Boudet, who actually then buys Notre Dame de Marcial, gets rid of the Lazarists, and resets up Notre Dame de Marcial. But Jean V is the, the priest at René Labain at the same time, dies roughly the same time that Gask is kicked out of Notre Dame de Marcial. The problem is, is that Jean V dies on August the 30th, 1872. But when you look here at his tomb, you will see that he's listed his date of death is September the 1st, 1872. And it's written in a very strange way. Mort le premier sepre 1862, right? So it's very clear that the 1 and the 7 is being very present. We want that. There's that January 17 date. Now, he died in September, but we have the name Jean V, which is as close as you can get to the French word for January, right? jean -Vier. So there's jean -Vier, and there's the famous 17 pointing right out at you. And I don't think this is another coincidence. Coincidence after coincidence start telling you there's messages and everything that's going on. The tomb also stresses that <clears throat> jean -Vier was a, named a priest at age 32 and died at 64, which meant he had 32 years in the white world as a regular person. He had 32 years in the black world as a priest. That would make up the 64 squares of the chess checkerboard and would make up the 64 tigrams of the I Ching. Here's Henry Boudet. Here's Henry Boudet, the man who took over for Jean V. He's one of the only people in this entire story that actually scares me. Uh, right from the first time I saw pictures of him, it's kind of like, this is not a guy I would want to get upset with me. I don't want to necessarily say that he's evil or something, but I certainly would not trust this guy. He took over in priest uh, when Jean V died in 1872. He had been born in 1837 and what was odd for a priest at this time in France is that he studied English. He became an English expert and that would be important in the book he was going to write. He first became a priest at Durban near Perelos, which is linked to Saunier. They both had the same linking, linking set. He then worked in a place where he got, uh, got assistance from Henry Gask. So Gask was then his teacher before he took over in 1872, and he stayed for 42 years as the priest at René Labain. Then he then comes to his very strange book. So in 1886, he writes this particular book, titled exactly, The True Celtic Language and the Cromelex of René Labain. A cromelex is said to be an old Druidic stone circle, but in Welsh, the word can also mean bent or curved, and a lek can mean a, a slab or a flagstone. So it's very unclear what the word cromalek is, is, be, is referring to in this title. But we, but we do know it is clear uh, that is, the book is extremely strange. <laughs> it's extremely strange. And it's been, it's been said many times that you will not understand the Rennes Le Chateau story if you don't understand this book. And I'm going to try to give you a couple of clues to it. Probably none of you are going to read it. I've read quite a lot of it. And even, uh, of course, I've read the English translation of it, and it's very, very difficult to follow. It's, it's obviously written in code. The book is written in some sort of bizarre code, and you have, to, you have to uncover the code of the book 
to figure out anything of what it's telling you. But there's more strange stuff to Boudet before we get to the book. A uh, gentleman writing in, 18, in uh, 1988, Jean-Pierre Motes, wrote, um, At the end of every term A season, Boudet met up with a friend with a stepladder, and they would both disappear into the hills for some time. If you comprehend the circumstances or the relevancy of these unexplained excursions, then you might come close to understanding the true secret of Rennes le Chateau. So what's the secret that Boudet needs to leave and constantly go in the countryside with a friend and a ladder? Is he climbing up something? Is he climbing down something? What is he looking for? Is he marking the landscape? There's indication that, that uh, the book is uh, laying out 12 places of treasure on the landscape. Others saying that it's 12 specific spots that create a giant labyrinth that you would wind through the landscape and get understanding if you followed it. His book is, how do, how do I describe his book? It's basically very comic wordplay that says English is the foundation language of all of the place names in southern France. So he says that all of the names in, in the landscape are really English names. And then he tries to use his knowledge of English to explain what the, what the, what the words really mean. That's the best way I can just simply describe this book. But almost all of the explanations he gives as to what, what, uh, what an English word defines as, his definition of English words, almost every word is wrong. <laughs> like it's completely wrong. And remember, this is a guy who should be an expert in the English language. So it's obvious he's playing with you in what he's doing with the book. Um, he, he made 500 copies of the book, of which uh, cost him 5,382 gold francs. He paid for it himself. Only 98 were actually sold. 100 were given to libraries. 210 were given to friends, visitors, and particularly the elites of Europe. He's got all sorts of letters of thanks, including one from Queen Victoria in 1889. So what exactly are the elite of Europe so needing to read in some obscure priest in southern France's book and in fact need to send him a thank you note specifically for the great work that he's done? The remaining 102 copies of the book were destroyed on his deathbed in 1914. The new Bishop of Carcassonne, I believe, is the one who actually made him burn the books. Um, so, there are odd illustrations in the book, all done by his brother. One that includes a devil face in the landscape. A Dutch writer, Josh Bertelot, claimed that in 1891 there was a code in the book that led to the sanctuary of Notre Dame de Marcielle where he found a hidden vault on the banks of the river. And we'll get to that in the next set. And again, remember, Saunier's renovations of Rennes-le-Chateau start in roughly the same year Boudet finishes writing his book. Let's look a little more into what his book attempts to say. And I'm just going to give a couple of, uh, again, I'm going to shorten this video so it's, so it's watchable. But I, I would urge you, if you really interest this, to go, go look into this for yourself. He claims that his book will be a guide to find the splendid Celtic monument existing at Rennes le bain He again says that the pagan places of, that, that the, the, the Christian missionaries in the area had changed the names of the local pagan places of worship and marked crosses on many of the monoliths, which Boudet claims brings him great sadness. So why, as a Christian priest, would he be so sad of the Christian takeover of the original pagan places of worship when that's supposed to be the job of the Catholic Church. See, everything in here is, is giving you a completely strange understand, giving you a strange uh, pointer as to what's going on here. A problem remains, of course, that now, and even when Boudet was there, there was no giant stone circle at Rennie Bay. So again, it's what is this Cromelec that he's trying to talk about? Now, it, it indicates again, sneakily, that the Cromelec he's referring to has nothing to do with stones on the landscape. He does say the Cromelec of René Le Bain is closely related to resurrection. Okay, does that mean it's a tomb? Is it Christian? Is it some sort of teaching? Is it related to the Cathars, the Templars, black magic? If it's Christianity, there can only be two resurrections being referred to, and that's Jesus or Lazarus. And as we'll see in the story, 
this group of St. Vincent de Paul and the Lazarus become very, very important. So I wonder if the resurrection being talked about has nothing to do with Jesus, but has to do with the resurrection of Lazarus, which if we understand the story is not about making someone who's dead, physically dead, become alive. It's about somebody who is physically dead, as in, who is dead as in asleep, as in not knowing their true nature, order through, you might say, to the trans, transmissive Transmissive, transmissive power of Jesus, the Zen teacher in this case, allowed him to become alive, awake. So is this a story of, is, is the Kromalek somehow related to what happened to Lazarus? Um, on page 11, he begins his analysis. And he says, he starts, the first word that he wants to use to explain is the word bren, which he defines as ground corn. Um, but in French, this word also means a sound. So it's, it's like the first word he's defining is already getting us to look into sound or music or, or what he's pointing to. Uh, in a sense, he's saying one has to listen to the words, which is a clue of hermetic writing. Um, he then says, um, the need to understand slang, especially the language of the birds and the horses, to approach the temple. And then, as in Jericho, with the sounds of the trumpets, the walls will let us pass. Okay, well, the language of birds is also known uh, as the, by the hermetic idea of Tehute, the knowledge of, the knowledge of birds. In fact, the entire Longyu Dock, the lang which is the language of Ok, the area, the Longyu Dock, the language of Ok being the language of the eight, so the language of Tehute Hermes, or the language of Jesus. So the word for the location is already indicating that something about this area and language is absolutely key. And it's like Boudet is trying to take in his book some other level, but in sort of a very strange, comical way. And I'll give you just one example of this. The whole book is like this. But on page 147, he gets the reader's attention by claiming the word ouch in English means a gold collar or the setting of an invaluable stone. And again, anyone who knows anything about English knows that the word ouch is a sound that's made when something is painful. It's to get our attention. And again, it's a code about being alert to what he's saying. And then we have to remember that the, the Holy Grail is often claimed to be an invaluable stone. In fact, Wolfram was one of the first ones of the early Grail writers to be very clear that the Grail was a stone, uh, linking it to the Philosopher's Stone. So is he now linking the entire area of the Cromelech of René Lebain to the Holy Grail and to the Philosopher's Stone of Alchemy? He then goes on into a long pronouncement of how this similar word uh, similar becomes the word auk, uh, which is in a Celtic pronunciation becomes auch, and becomes the true name of the city he's talking about. Auch has this, has this link through auch, through Anglo-Saxon, Anglo to the word auch, which is the word that's being used in the landscape. And it's, uh, it's comical when you read Boudet's book. It's actually comical if you take it at face value. When you start not taking the book at face value is where it begins to open up. So I don't want to go into more detail of, of, the, of the word play. I'm just presenting it to you for you to go look at it for yourself. He speaks somewhere else of a cave that will be a temporary shelter. And in this cave, we will see a burning hearth marked by the image of the shroud. So one could say this is the tomb of Jesus, but in hermetic terminology, the cave would, is the center of the mind, and the burning hearth would be the pineal gland, and the shroud could be seen as the external ego that's being shed in the process. Um, this will also link to a painting that I'm going to show now. This particular painting, which hangs in René Labain, and was given by, um, by Paul, Paul Urban de Fleury, the local lord who had married into the de Houtpool Blanchefort family, the one who, of course, was involved with the tombstones and the supposed original secret at Rennes le Chateau. So the very guy who marries into the family gives this particular painting to René LeBain. Okay, on the surface, it seems nothing too special. It's called Christ. It's called Christ, Christ with the hair. And on one sense, it's maybe, it's maybe asking people to refer to like the rabbit in Alice in Wonderland to go chasing the rabbit. But Christ with the hair has Christ, after being taken down from the cross, inside a cave. Now, we've just talked about the cave being representing the center of the mind, and the, the burning hearth is the pineal gland, right? The, the, the body there would be the egoic self that's been shed. But notice, first of all, that Jesus is really, really robust and healthy. I mean, this is one of the most 
strong painted Jesus as you could possibly see. Inside is just one female, that's the Virgin Mary. His hanging hand is pointing to a plate that is poised on the ground. There seems to be a spider. What's really, what gets everyone's attention is his, his right knee, which appears to have been, which many claim to be um, painted in the shape of a rabbit's head, a hare's head. I don't necessarily see that. That's what's being said. Uh, and I think that might be a misdirection too as to why this, is, and we'll get to why this might be called the Christ the hare. And I think that's a, trying to say it's, it's what's on his knee is a misdirection. There, there's something on his knee, and that, that there, but it has nothing to do with the rabbit's head, I don't think. We also look at his, uh, the way his, his uh, arm, his, his left arm is hanging, and it's almost, it, it's hanging in a very strange position. Okay, so let's take a look at this painting in a little more detail. And the painting in more detail, we need to go back to the original version of this which was painted in, I'm not sure if it's, eight, some says uh, uh, 1636, others say 1629, but it's, a, it's an original Van Dyck, um, one of the Dutch masters, and here we see a much more complete version. Uh, the René Lebain painting has had it flipped around, but we're missing two important characters here. We're missing Mary Magdalene, Magdalene who is kissing the hand, which in the other, which in the other painting is just pointing down to the plate. In this one, she's kissing the hand, and we have, we don't, I'm not sure if it's a man or a woman in a red cloak. These two elements are not in the painting of René LeBain. We find another one in the Sarazo Church in North Brittany. And again, it has the Mary Magdalene. This, is a, this, this church is very important because it's been, it is specifically mentioned in Boudet's book, even though it's in Brittany, and the church has copies of two Poussin paintings. Mm -hmm. Now we look at a drawing from the same period called the Lamentation. And again, we're getting a better idea here of what the original picture looks like. Now let's go back to the one at René LeBain, and here Mary Magdalene and the red cloak has disappeared. Now, if you look in the distance, because again, this has been reversed, so if you look in the distance, it would be the right arm now of Christ that would be the one that Magdalene would be kissing. If you look at the rocks in the background, the rocks have the shape of a mouth, and it's almost like they've got the shape of teeth. So are the rocks now in the background attempting to represent the Magdalene in the painting? Why has she been taken out of the painting? Why has the man in the red cloak been taken out of the painting? It's, it's obviously a key choice. We, we, we know what painting is that they were using as the, as the base for this. Why did they want them taken out? Well, the reason for wanting them taken out might have to do with this painting. That is called the Crucifixion. It is also at René LeBain. And what is quite, and it's, and in a sense, it's a beautiful painting. But there becomes a very strange element with this painting, and that is... The background and you won't see it until here the two backgrounds get placed together and you'll notice that the background where the rock was in the one painting and the side area of the other here this little mountain or hill perfectly matches so in essence these two paintings become one painting we have the crucifixion uh, facing into the cave where Jesus and Mary are sitting but we have the two characters removed the two Magdalene and the other removed from the painting Okay, that's interesting enough. We know who made the first painting, right? The, uh, we know who, had, who commissioned it, uh, or I'm sorry, who donated it. That was Paul Urban de Fleury. And supposedly he donated this painting at the end of the 17th century. Now, the second painting was added later, painted by our buddy, the priest of Notre Dame de Marcial, Henry Gask. The guy who is supposedly, potentially, the starter of the entire mystery with one of the most strange churches in all of southern France that he personally renovates is the guy who makes this particular painting that matches up with the Christ hair painting perfectly. So when it comes to paintings, what is so unbelievably important about Notre Dame de Marcial? That would be this painting right here, and that is a St. Anthony painting. St. Anthony being the, um, St. Anthony being, um, how to describe this? It's it's dealing with the fire and the Pentecost and the and the uh, and the, um, the the fire of the Spirit coming into him. And of course, we have all the temptation paintings and how that had been a part. Remember Poussin and the temp and the no temptation of Saint Anthony. But here in Notre Dame de Marcial, 
key linked to René Labin is a St. Anthony painting. And I don't want to go into more detail other than to say at this time, in this particular painting, St. Anthony is known as the Christ Hare, the Christ Rabbit. So who is the Christ Rabbit? Who is, who is Christ with the hare in the cave? Because St. Anthony is always known for being in the cave and being tempted in the cave. So is, is Jesus somehow St. Anthony? Is St. Anthony with Jesus in this cave? Is the people that are uh, removed somehow related to St. Anthony? You can see how once you begin to explore and, and expand the mystery, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. One more element. Let's look at uh, let's look at um, let's look at the uh, painting again in René Labay, and the positioning the positioning of Christ in the painting. Now, on the landscape uh, near Rennes le Chateau is this. It's known as the Devil's Armchair, and supposedly one of the suggestions is it's a seat for the head of the de Fleury family. That it's supposed to be like a throne in the landscape where the head of the Fleury family would sit, the very family that donated this particular painting to René LeBay. But if you look at it closely, it's, of course, it's called the Devil's Armchair, as if it's somehow related to the devil. And in fact, the devil statue in Rennes le Chateau, some have said, would sit very easily into the Devil's Armchair as well. <clears throat> but if you look closely at the painting again, you see that the position of Jesus and the way that the rocks are positioned because it's not a chair he's in. That's a, in a sense, carved rock. Looks very similar to the devil's armchair in the landscape. So has that devil's armchair been brought into the particular painting for a message for a reason? I'm not answering a lot of this stuff now. I'm just sharing it with you. Here's another one that's very interesting. This is from, this is also at René LeBain. This is another painting. And for anyone who knows their tarot cards very well, you would know that actually this is tarot card number five right, the uh, Hierophant, or sometimes called the Pope card. And the background in this painting is René LeBain. That is the church, that is the hills behind it. I mean, this, this is René LeBain. So why does a Catholic church run with <clears throat> all of these strange things about it, want to have this particular uh, tarot card painted on its walls? Who is the Pope that's being referred to? Is it Boudet? Is he, is he a pope or a hierophant? Is it Saunier? Is it Henry Gask that's in, supposed to be in this painting? Is it the Bishop of Carcassonne? Is it someone else? Is it St. Anthony? Is it Jesus? Is it whoever? You see how the mystery takes us deeper and deeper. It throws us as well onto the death of Henry Boudet. And the death of Boudet is also unbelievably strange. He dies in uh, 1915 in his uh, sort of near his, his, his birth home, Aksat, Aksat, many claim he was poisoned. They claim that because the body stank so bad immediately after his death that they needed to bury him immediately, that he, he couldn't go through the normal burial procedure. They had, to get, they had to get the body in the ground extremely quickly. He has two particular memorials. This is the one that's at René Labain. This is not his, his grave. This is a memorial. Um, and while most would say that the cup at the top is the represents the year Christ. A lot of people are trying to are trying to say that it's the Holy Grail, and that Boudet is somehow linked to not just perhaps the knowledge, but the actual location, in some case, or or the actual understanding of what the Holy Grail is. The words around it say, "Love one another, and I have loved you," which is a little bit odd language-wise, but okay, we get the point. When you look at his tomb, though, his tomb is very different. <clears throat> his tomb at Axlat is mostly just a, a slab on the ground, but has this raised um, piece at the front, which many claim to be a book, and has this very unique marking on it. Now, some have tried to say that it uh, represents uh, Jesus, uh, particularly Jesus in the form of the Pisces fish, which... Um, Part of the reason Christ is the fisherman is because this time frame is moving from the time frame of, of astrologically, right, from Aries into Pisces. So you just as just as the Bible wanted you to stop moving, which was being written just after the Old Testament was being presented just after the um, end of the age of Taurus. So why you want to get rid of the golden calves and the and the bull symbolism? It's not to do with not worshiping God. It's trying to say that the age of Taurus is over. Now we're in the age of the Ram.
the age of the ram is now ending, and they were in the age of Pisces. We'll be moving, of course, to Aquarius, or are moving to Aquarius, or have moved to it, like, really soon. No one can really tell exactly when it's happening. Others, though, claim that this is a code for um, page 310 of his book, that it's that the, 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 the uh, raised cement area is Boudet's book, and this is a code of what to look for in the book. Uh, lots of people have looked on pages 310 and 311 of, of the Cromlechs of Brandy LeBain to try to get an answer for it. Some believe they have. As to date, no one that I've come across has been able to get what could possibly be this particular symbol. A couple of other odd little pieces of the cemetery of Rennie LeBain. That is our buddy, Paul Vincent de Fleury, right? The same guy who made the painting, the same guy who married into the de Blanchefort family, the same guy who's got the, arm, the devil's armchair, supposedly named for him. He had two graves and Rennie LeBain. Each grave had a completely different date of birth and a completely different date of death. Now, one of those graves has been removed recently, so I think it's been the last five years they've gotten rid of it. And I think it's the one that had his date of death being May the 1st, 1776. Why is that date important? Because a lot of people have claimed that is the formation date of the Illuminati, that May, 1, May 1, 1776 is the reason why May 1 has been, in a sense, tried to be made into a holiday, right? That it's really an Illuminati day in 1776. Of course, that is a year that is presented over and over again of key elements, particularly in the United States. Um, I also had an odd <clears throat> feeling that maybe it's not the date the Illuminati was formed. Maybe it's the day that if this is a time loop, perhaps that's the date that this time loop begins, that our time loop runs from May 1, 1776 to whatever date it ends, goes back, but it doesn't loop back to 1775 or 1750. It loops back to 1776. Just a possibility. The other gravestone that I want to mention, oh, there is, a, there is, uh, there is the pillar too. There's a pillar in the, in the Rennie LeBay Cemetery that's almost identical to the pillar that Saunier had the uh, mission, uh, 1891, carved into. And there was supposed to be two altar pillars. Uh, and no one has known what's happened to the second one, and some suggest this is it, that for some reason the Rennes Le Chateau other altar pillar was moved into the cemetery of Rennes Le Bay. But we have this gravestone, which is, seems to be rather recent, and it says, when I translate it, Sidi Baba, dead by death, then nothing dies. But death of the soul, then nothing lives. Jean-Paul Marie de Magdala. Now, this is a very strange stone. Now, there, there's, researchers have claimed that there is a, was a person from Turkey or, or the Orient or something who lived in this area, it was named Sidi Baba. But the, the specifics of the, of the message, that's, that's as awake wisdom as you can get. Like, like you couldn't possibly get a, a small piece of awakening, um, awakening poetry than, you know, dead by death, then nothing dies, but death of the soul, then nothing lives. How incredible is that, you know? Some suggest there's an Egyptian mummy underneath the tomb, but there's no one that can verify that for sure. So, I think that's where I'll end. I'll start the next session, because I want to keep this in a little tighter. So we'll start the next session, session with the death of Antoine Gillis. Uh, we'll go into more detail on, on the story of his death in Custasa. We'll look in complete more detail on Notre Dame de Marcial, the things that are in the church, the tombs that are there, the Poussin, the two strange Poussin paintings that were found recently of ships and what those ships mean, how they may link to a document called the Serpent Rouge. Uh, depending how much time we have after that, we'll see if we can get into some of the other stuff of the landscape, uh, the other churches and, and area, or we may have to move that to the next video. Thanks for watching. Those of you who have, I know this isn't the this isn't sort of the key focus of, of the videos. This is more just for the, those of you who are really interested in the story. And um, so I know this is, this is not my prime videos, like my last Plato's cave video, which was has got tremendous response, and I really appreciate the response that's come from it. Uh, it's, a, it's been an interesting video to hear your responses on. And I'll get into more of those in the upcoming weeks, and I'll try to keep this again to every two or three weeks, another 30 or 40 minutes, next story of our history of southern France. Thanks for watching, 
and uh, see you in a few days with something new.